All right, so cool looking dendrograms, you can do a lot more, um, but I just wanted to show you that you have to write a function and then this function is applied to every node, so every node of the dendrogram, and you can color and change every node if you want it to. You have a question, Sir Skurita? That's why I put in the queue. <laughs> so that when people have a question, I see a hand raised. Um, all right, so dendrograms and phylogenetic trees um, are very related to each other. Um, but there is this special package called APE. Um, hey, you have to remember to install it, and that can help you make really cool looking. Uh, um, no, don't, you don't, don't be sorry, that's okay. Um, but, and that can help you make like really cool looking phylogenetic trees. And phylogenetic trees are ubiquitous in biology, um, so you can use it for more or less everything um, to kind of show like um, inheritance of alleles, but you can also show, for example, the, the distance, you can use it to make a, cre of, uh, a tree of life, um, and they are used a lot in biology, and they're kind of really understandable pictures. Um, so you can um, load the library, you have to install it first, but after you've loaded the library you can just use a haclust object or any other clustering method. Of course haclust is not the only clustering method that there is, um, but hey, you can use any clustered object, so a haclust object, um, and then you just say as phylo, and then it makes a phylogenetic tree out of it. And then you can plot it, and you can, for example, do things like magnification and label offset and all of these things. Um, but you now also have the, uh, the option to make things like cladograms, unrooted trees, and you can also make fan plots of your clustering. Um, so how do these look? So this is more or less how the basic tree looks like. It's a standard kind of uh, dendrogram, um, but then rotate it um, on its side. Um, and it, the cladogram is the same thing, but then it uses the triangle format. You can make unrooted trees, which kind of look like this on the same data. And you can also make fans, which start in the middle and then fan out in a circle um, surrounding the plot. So it just gives you a little bit more overview of how they look. Um, so yeah, just try it out on your own data or try it out during the assignments uh, and make a couple of these um, things. And of course also here you can use the phylogenetic tree and also add colors to it using the same kind of system where you define a function which then is applied to every node in the, in the graph. So a little bit of a real life example. Um, I wanted to show you how I plot chromosomal data, so data which has, for example, a chromosome position um, and, for example, some kind of a statistics on each of the markers that you have. And so imagine that you did a SNP chip and you genotyped like a hundred individuals, and now you want to show some statistical data on each of these hundred positions or a thousand positions in the genome that you measured. Um, yeah, so there's two things that we have to do. We have to plot the chromosomes first and then we want to add some information to the chromosomes. So yeah, the data that we have is something called markers and markers are single nucleotide polymorphisms or they're like duplications in the genome or anything that we can use to kind of distinguish one animal from another animal or one human from another human. Um, yeah, so a marker has a location Right? The marker is located on chromosome 1 at 10 megabases um, and of course these markers have some kind of a statistics. Um, I could have calculated for each marker um, the amount of animals in one group versus the amount of animals in the other group. And then I can do like a, a statistical test to see if there's a over-representation of a certain amount of animals in the one group versus the other ones. Um, we might have things like genotypes at these markers, so have for these hundred individuals, some individuals might have an A there and other individuals might have a G there in the genome. And of course um, chromosomes, they have a length um, and I need to know the length of each chromosome to be able to plot them. So the first step that I'm doing is I'm using a mouse example, so I'm saying um, make our chromosomes, so I do S character 1 to 19, because a mouse has 19 autosomes, it has an X chromosome, a Y chromosome, and it has a mitochondrial genome, which is called MT. 
Um, I read in the data, so the lengths of the chromosome are mentioned here. So this is just a very basic matrix which has two columns. The first column is the name of the chromosome, which is a character, and the second is a numerical value which is the length of the chromosome. So it looks like this. Um, chromosome 1 has a length of 195 million base pairs. Chromosome 2 is 182 million base pairs. And I have some kind of statistic, right? So the statistics that I have is um, called ratios. Um, so these are just some random ratios that I came up with. And here what we see is we have an, a gene, right? So if, for example, a certain gene, which is located on chromosome 1 at this position, and the ratio at this gene was 0 0.78. Um, and of course, we have like perhaps 100 or 1,000 of, um, of these measurements across the whole genome. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to create a plot and I always start with an empty plot, right? So what I'm going to do is say um, find the maximum length, so the longest chromosome and put that in a variable called m length, so max length or the maximum length of the chromosome. So then I'm going to do my plot, so the y-axis is going to range from 0 to the maximum length the x-axis is going to range from 1 to the number of rows in the chromosome info, right? So the, the number of chromosomes that I have. Type is none, because I don't want to have 0, 1 and max length number of rows plotted, because otherwise it would put two circles here and a circle here. I'm going to say that don't plot a y-axis, don't put anything on the x, uh, x label, um, don't put any y label here and don't put any x axis there as well because I am going to do the axis. So the first thing that I'm going to do is just say I want to have some lines in the background um, so that I kind of can see um, where like 10 megabases is, right? So I'm saying here um, use a sequence from 0 to the maximum length of the chromosome um, and step per 10 million every time. And then the color of these is light gray and they are dotted so they, they, they look a little bit more fancy. So I'm then going to add the chromosome and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the lines function and I'm just going to draw lines from bottom to top. Um, so how this works is I, I'm going through the chromosome info um, from and I'm going to call this n, so I'm just going to go through every row, and then I'm going to plot a line where the x position is n, n, so the start will be n, the end will be at n, x, right, because the, the start here is at x1, and the end is also at x1, so I'm just going to say x equals c, n, n. Then I'm going to take the y position, and the y position, of course, every chromosome starts at zero base pairs, and I'm just going to take the length of the current chromosome and just plot it, and yeah, so that the line's y position is here at zero and here at like 190 million base pairs. Type is line, color is black, line type is one, line white is two, to make them a little bit more bold, so to speak. And then I'm going to add the ratio data to the plot. So, and I'm going to use the apply function. So I have this all data, right, which contains all of my genes and the ratios and the positions of these genes. Um, so I'm going to go through the rows of all data, and then I have a function which gives, which every time gets one row of the matrix, and I'm going to call the row of the matrix X in my case. And then I'm going to say, well, I'm going to match the chromosome name to the chromosomes. And this is, of course, because three of the chromosomes, like X, Y, and MT, are not numerical values. So I have to match them to get the correct position, because, of course, chromosome X will be at position 20, um, Y will be at 21, and mitochondria will be at 22. The y lock is the start position, so that's the, the position of the gene where it starts, um, and this is the y position. And then I'm just going to define my color, right? I'm going to just say, well, if the ratio is above 1, then I want to have it colored red, and if the ratio is below 1, I want to have it colored black. So I'm just going to ask, is the ratio above 1? So this will be true or false. So true is 1, false is 0, and then I have to add plus 1 right? Because otherwise zero is not a color in R. So R colors like black is one, red is uh, two, and I think green is three. But yeah, so every color has a number as well. And then I'm just going to use the points function and I'm going to say at the position 
X, right? So at the start position, uh, or at the at the chromosomal position, which is the X location. The Y location is the start position of the gene. I'm going to use the PCH of just a a straight line so this is just the minus symbol which I want to use and then I'm going to say the color is the color that I just computed and I'm going to make them a little bit bigger and then my plot looks like this um, which is a kind of a representation so now you can see that we have a marker here of which the ratio was below one and we have a marker here on chromosome 3 for which the ratio was above one of course I want to add the axis and a legend so I'm just going to say axis on one right so at each position and so take the, the names of chromosome info which is one two three four but also X Y and Z and put these at one to the number so at one to twenty one in our case um, LES is one CX is 1.5 so that they show up a little bit bigger and the LES is so that they get rotated in the right position um, and then on the second axis, I'm going to add the position 0 to the maximum length. I'm going to step by a million divided by a million. So I'm just going to put every million base pairs, I'm going to put a number. But I don't want the number to be like with six or seven zeros behind it. I'm just going to divide out this million. Um, and then at these positions, I'm going to write the, the, the length in, in instead of writing down one million I'm just going to write one um, and then of course hey, I want to have a legend on the top right of the plot and it would say up and down because the ratio is either above or below um, and then I'm going to say use the fill function one and two and make the CX 1.2 so then in the end it will look like this so I have my legend here I now have my chromosomes here and here you see the um, mega base pair positions of each of the chromosomes of course, is it really finished? No, this is not finished by far. There are still a lot of things that we need to do in R because we want to have a good plot, right? So we we need to add a title. We need to add a description to the y uh, to the y axis. We need to add a description to the x axis. And here you see that the blue dotted lines go behind the legend. Um, so we want to give the legend a background color to to be on top of this. Um, so hey, it takes a lot of time to create a good plot in R. So my procedure to plotting, uh, plots are often a multi-step procedure. Um, I usually draw them very quickly by hand, very coarsely, and then I start thinking of how to make the plot that I want to make um, with the data that I have. And the way that I do it is I first do the static kind of things, so the layout like chromosomes or grid lines, and then afterwards I take my data and I plot my data kind of row by row onto the plot that I have. So that's, that's kind of my standard procedure for plotting. So remember, it takes time to make things beautiful. Um, also make sure that your plotting code that you are writing is flexible, right? So you can see that in the chromosome plot, I take a lot of effort to not specify 23 or 22 or 21. I never write down the number of chromosomes that I have explicitly. I always use the input file, right? So that in case I want to now not plot for mice, but want to plot for cows. Cows have a completely different number of chromosomes. But the plot function will still work because I can still, hey, I can add more chromosomes to the chromosome info thing. Um, and then that will automatically get picked up by my script and it will automatically draw 31 chromosomes instead of 19 or 20. Um, so. Yeah, so that is what I mean by um, use flexible plotting code. So code which doesn't have hard-coded numbers in there, um, but uses numbers from a file. So I can just update the file or use a different file for a different species and I don't have to change the code. What I also always do is that I make two versions of each plot. I make one version which is suitable for presentations and I make a version which is in PDF um, for an eventual publication or a paper that we're going to write. Um, and so th there's different requirements for plots that go into a presentation um, compared to plots which go into a paper. Right? A presentation you generally want to use like bigger dots um, and you want to have like good colors while sometimes papers um, or, or journals they want to have black and white plots. So instead of having like very colorful plots, the journal requires you that the plot is 
um, black and white and uses a certain font um, and that of course you 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 can put in uh, so I always make two versions of each plot one for PowerPoint and one for PDFs okay some requirements for a good plot it has to have a clear axis a clear label um, it has to have a good representation of quantities and I always add the units uh, to the axis right I want to know if it's wind in miles per hour or in centimeters or in meters so you have to have units in your plots a plot always needs to have a legend and a legend always needs to mention everything in the plot so if there's a line in the plot the line needs to be in the legend as well um, and of course if it is available add things like error bars and standard deviations yeah, because that that's the way that if you work in science you have to show that there was some variation in your measurements yeah, so when you have a box plot uh, or no not a box plot but if you have like a, a bar plot right then the bar plot should have an error bar um, which is the standard deviation that you saw in your data so yeah, because you're not having a single measurement you're having a group of measurements all right, and then I'm through. So I took a little bit more time than I have expected. So if there's any questions, um, then ask them now. I will mute my desktop audio and then I will call Misha to see if that works. All right, so I get actually bothered by like a loud sound. All right, so there we have Misha. Hey, um, let me put the Skype thing open that should be like this and then see if that works um, properties and I am talking to Misha and then okay and that works all right so there you are Misha um, can you say something yeah I can all right very good no glitches no glitches can people hear Misha that's the first question I'm going to